Welcome everybody to Radicalized Truth Survives. We are now on the 102nd episode of RadPod and we are going to be bringing back Craig Unger and quite frankly, Jim Hi-Fi and I couldn't think of anybody more important to bring back in this time than our friend Craig, who has of course authored the seminal books about GOP deceit. Let's go ahead and have a listen. All right, Craig Unger, we are so grateful to have you back uh, at this time, particularly as we approach November and we see all of the narrative warfare already in play. And where I wanted to start with you, as our viewers know, you have written key books on Trump, Russia, American Compromat, and House of Trump and House of Putin. And you've been doing this work for a very long time. But why is it that you're just now suddenly being discovered by more of a mainstream audience? Like suddenly it's like you just sort of, you know, uh, arrived on the scene. And why do you think it is when you've been doing this work this whole time? Right. I, I, my work has always been uh, on the margins. That is, I, you know, I think I have all the standards of a real professional journalist. I've been written for the New Yorker, the New York Times, Esquire, Vanity Fair, for more than 50 years. And I published with the three biggest publishing houses in the country. And three of my books have actually been uh, bestsellers. Uh, but you know what, when it comes to uh, some of the allegations I, ma I make in them, the New York Times and other publications really shy away from them. And now we have uh, Trump running once again, of course, and I've done two books on him. Uh, both uh, making serious uh, charges about him in Russia. Uh, one is how he laundered money for the Russian mafia, and I go into great detail on that. Another is how he was recruited uh, as an asset by the KGB, this dates back to 1980. Um, and again, both of those books made the New York Times bestseller list, but the New York Times refused to cover them in any way. Didn't review them, didn't write anything about it. And you don't find those allegations in, in, in the mainstream press at all. Uh, and I think they should be. And why I see your work so valuable, and I'm grateful that there is a wider audience decide that, despite that kind of uh, you know mainstream blockade, uh, is because I think that people in America have already forgotten, they've forgotten the coup, number one, they memory hold that, right? But they have already forgotten that Trump was clearly working for the Russians in his first term. And once again, you know, you have provided all the evidence, so much of what uh, people who study this world know is from the work that you have done. And why is it that, you know, uh, people are actually flirting with this again when we know what it's going to mean for the world. We know what it's going to mean for Ukraine. We know what it's going to mean for our own country and the freedoms that we have gotten kind of used to. Right. Well, well, uh, the American media has been so fragmented that it's hard to get anything across uh, with, with uh, in a powerful way. Uh, when When I was starting out in journalism, you had stories like, uh, the Pentagon Papers, the My Lai Massacre, or Watergate, which, uh, you know, everyone in America knew about at the time. It changed history. We remember them uh, 50 years later, and they shaped the national conversation. Today, a lot of those, uh, uh, you know, these big stories barely get out at all. And if they do, they're marginalized. And the press has been atomized into a, a zillion little tweets and uh, or whatever they call them on what used to be Twitter now. So uh, there, it, it's very hard to, for anything I do anyway to really reshape the national conversation. It's incredible. And yet we are in the precipice, precipice of what I know is going to be another best-selling book. And in October, people are going to be able to read Den of Spies, and we are going to encourage everybody uh, to pre-order this book. I already pre-ordered mine. What can you tell us? Because I know that in Den of Spies, it continues work that you started parallel to so much of what we're uh, enduring right now. Right. Well, briefly, and I, I can't go into it in much detail, but this is the election of 1980 
Jimmy Carter was president. He was running for re-election. Uh, and at the end of 79, Iran had captured 52 American hostages. And the and, and the whole election became, could Carter get the, the uh, hostages back before the election, in which case he'd be a hero and would probably win re-election, or not, in which case he'd be viewed as someone who allowed America to be humiliated. And of course, he, he did not get them back and Reagan won. Uh, and uh, what I've been investigating, and this is an investigation that's gone on for more than 30 years, is uh, uh, did the Reagan-Bush campaign make a secret deal with Iran in which they said, don't return the hostages. If you return the hostages, Carter will win. Uh, we will, uh, if you hold the hostages till later, we will send you weapons because uh, Iran was just uh, at war with Iraq and they were in desperate need of uh, spare parts and arms for their war. It's just, I feel like America has been held hostage ever since that moment. Gentlemen, Jim. Um, I, I a little bit stuck on on the the New York Times and the and the kind of corporate media these days um, because what what I'm seeing right now feels very much like a like just plagiarism of the past. Um, the New York Times in 1987, as you well know, uh, published a full page advertisement from Donald Trump. Um, arguing that we should withdraw from NATO after he went to Moscow for the first time. Yeah. And yet the New York Times refuses to refused in 2016 to admit that Donald Trump was clearly an agent of the Russian government. And not only that, published disinformation saying that, you know, he had more or less been um, you know, exonerated by the FBI. Um, so I'm just curious, sort of, you know, what your thoughts are about where we are in the current situation, um, how we ended up with this obvious Russian agent as one of the two candidates, while the New York Times is trying to attack the Democratic candidate as hard as they possibly can with multiple editorials and and that right. whole thing. It feels, it feels very pattern-like to me, and I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Right. I, I don't have uh, anyone in the Times who's whispering me what's really oh, sure. going on there. And, it, and it, it, it's often true that um, uh, it, I think it's dangerous to think of it as a uh, um, you know, even though it is one corporation, they, it speaks with many, many different voices. And there are people who sort of get the the sense of, uh, uh, you know, you know when it, that, that when a reporter chooses a story, it may not be the most explosive story. They may want to do a story that gets them in good with their editor or something like that. And one of the things I, I write about in my next book a little is the... Um, uh, I think the, the dangers of access journalism. And uh, it seems to me that some people at times want to keep, uh, uh, make sure they have access to the Trump, Trump people. And if that's the case, they're going to be doing stories that won't offend the tr Trump people. Um, it, you know, I, I thought it was very interesting I, uh, back in 2016 when Paul Manafort became uh uh, campaign manager for Donald Trump, the Times wrote about it and said that uh, Manafort's uh, hiring would give, would lend foreign policy gravitas to Donald Trump. And I almost burst out laughing. I mean, it was ridiculous. And the reporters who wrote it had done much more critical uh, pieces on Manafort years earlier. Uh, anyone in journalism who was covering Washington politics knew uh, a friend of mine named Art Levine did a brilliant takedown of Paul Manafort, 1992, I believe it was, and made fun of him and Roger Stone as uh, they were the uh, the the uh, the torturers uh, lobby. 
torture yeah. exactly the torturers lobby so this is something i've been aware of for more than uh god well over 30 years it's no joke and uh, uh the times doesn't acknowledge that and uh i suspect you know i've uh, you know for i've had long talk spent, spent time with roger stone and he makes himself into a desirable source he's very quotable he gives you time he can be rather amusing and funny people want to keep using him and that means they don't uh, write things that'll piss him off and it's as simple as that and it goes up to Henry Kissinger or the, the powers that be in, in the White House or are close to an administration and the Times has uh, repeatedly done that with Republicans they doesn't seem to do that so much as uh, with Democrats I once did a a Lexus Nexus search on Whitewater and the New York Times and I, I it seemed the Times had done over 2,000 stories on the Whitewater scandal. Mm -hmm. And if anyone remembers what that was, it really wasn't anything. Yeah. It, 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 you know, it was uh, the Clintons had made a bad investment, period. They lost money on it, period. Uh, but it became a multi-year investigation. It eventually led there into murders and all kinds it, of right yeah. phony murder conspiracy and, and yeah. uh but you can't it does seem to say you, you, uh, the times leans over backwards not to piss off the republicans and i i think it is fair to say that um, i i i feel like they've been leaning over backwards to not piss off the fascists for a long time you of course remember how wrong they got Hitler in the 20s when they said he was just using propaganda to bait the masses. And of course, you probably remember how wrong they got Stalin when they uh, uh, dispatched a reporter who basically obfuscated the fact that uh, Stalin was starving Ukrainians. And, uh, and of course, Stalin at that time then looked around and was like, wow, I can murder millions of people and there's no downside for me. So here we are re-experiencing, I'm re-experiencing 2016 PTSD. And why I say that is because in the Roger Stone indictment, there was a section about uh, how uh, Hillary was to, put, to be portrayed as old and having a stroke. And we know that there was doctored video. And again, we had, you know, almost two weeks ago, a bad performance, but on the one side, you had someone who, as Hi-Fi would say, could lead us toward a thousand years of darkness. On the other side, you had an older elder statesman who has been proving that he is on the side of democratic governance. And I bring that up because the New York Times has always been like, it's, it ain't news till it's in the New York Times. And we also have a friend who tried to get the New York Times to write about Leonard Leo which matters to this conversation because right. they didn't. And Leo ended up placing a half a dozen, uh, you know, Catholic activist extremists or some variation of Catholicism active, activist extremists who are uh, taking away all our rights. And to me, I, people, uh, you know, I call it fascism. I'm, I know this country is in terrible danger. And we, we look at something like the Times and say, you know, where are you? Uh, and they're out there doing, you know, uh, as Jim just said, you know, but his debate, like, but his emails, which is why your work is so important, because you have always seen what this is and how dangerous it is. And I don't think that's a question, but I'd love to hear you comment on that. Right. Well, I, I uh, you know, I was saying earlier that uh, to me, this goes back to the 60s. And you can see in 1964 and 65, when Lyndon Johnson was president, and he signed the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act for those years. Uh, it, it, that was a tremendous upheaval in uh, electoral politics in this country. Uh, I think a lot of young people don't realize that the Democrats were the bad guys in the Civil War. Uh, the Republicans were the party of Lincoln. And suddenly, w when Johnson signed those bills, he, he said correctly, well, it looks like we're going to lose the South. We, the Democrats, will lose the South for a couple of generations. 
And if anyone has looked at those red and blue electoral maps every year uh, and not noticed that, gee, those red states look an awful lot like the uh, con United Confederate States of America. And they are. And, and I think what's happened uh, since Trump is what we have now is sort of con the Confederacy 2.0. And after that, that every election starting with 1968, you see the Republicans again and again uh, resorting to malfeasance of one sort or another. Um, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, in, in 1968, a lot of people don't know this, but it, it, the, the Nixon at the last minute reached out to a, a, a woman named Anna Chenault, who was a, a Chinese national, and she was friends with the Vietnamese ambassador. And at the time, uh, Johnson really was trying to end the, the uh, Vietnamese war, and they were, had peace talks going on in Paris. And Nixon got Anna Chennault to intervene and get uh, the South Vietnamese to withdraw. So the last week of the campaign, it looked like the Democrats were incredibly incompetent. They couldn't even get their allies to the negotiating teal table. And um, Nixon beat Hubert Humphrey in a squeaker. Um, it, Lyndon Johnson taped all that, by the way. He had audio tapes of it, and Nixon knew about it. And Nixon then became very scared that they, those tapes would be used against him in 72. So he put together a group known as the White House Plumbers Unit, and they started breaking into the Brookings Institute and a place called the Watergate Hotel, where the Democrats had their offices. Free, and, right? And, and, yeah, so again, in, you have 68, you have 72. Uh, 76, Jimmy Carter wins. My next book is about 1980, and I believe you see the same thing going on again. And I think I make the case, uh, I, I think, definitively there. Um, in 1984, I'll give it to Reagan beating Mondale. I don't think they needed uh, help there. Um, but you uh, you see it again in 2000 with the uh, Bush v. Gore and the Brooks Brothers riots. Um, in 2004, it, it's not well known, but the whole election came down to the state of Ohio. And there was a lot of uh, uh, stuff going on in Ohio. I wrote about in my book, B Boss Rove, uh, and on and on with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Trump now. So I just want to bring up Ohio in 2000 because I was a young man living in Ohio during that. And uh, just not even 40 miles from my house, a IT tech guru who was involved in electronic voting died in a mysterious plane crash. And there was all sorts of things going on in the state of Ohio at that time around our Secretary of State. And it was ugly. Um, but my question for you, Mr. Unger, I see, maybe this is just me, but I see a massive, massive failure on the part of the FBI. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I see it just uh, McGonagall, the firing Guo Wengui's apartment. Uh, it, it seems like our FBI has been infiltrated by people who do not have the best interests of America at heart and are doing what they can. We know that there was an FBI agent named D'Antuono who held up the January 6th investigation, like didn't even want it to happen, right? Um, what are your thoughts about how long has the FBI been a problem and why? Well, I, again, I haven't written a book on this, but it, keep, it does surface again and again, especially my books on Trump. I mean, that, that you have two former directors of the FBI, William Sessions and Louis Free, who, after they retire, end up working for two of the most um, uh, dangerous uh, Russians around. Uh, uh, William Sessions was working for Semyon, uh, Semyon, Semyon Mogilevich, who is known as the Brainy Don, uh, and uh, was a multi-billionaire, and I write about him a lot in... Uh, House of House of Trump, House of Putin, 
And the second FBI director is Louis Free, who ended up uh, representing Prevazon, uh, which was uh, which was Bill Browder's company and is the key company involved in the Magnitsky Act. And uh, Free ended up in Palm Beach uh, with a very nice home near Mar-a-Lago and President Trump. And I know you don't even like to dignify uh, Trump with president because we all can see the coordination, what he called Russia, Russia. I did a whole 2016 election series looking back, election attack series looking back, and we can see the coordination between Russian military intelligence and what Stone was doing and what Manafort was doing. And the only reason we even know that our former uh, you know, heads of the FBI and our intelligence agents worked with the Russians is really because of the incredibly, you know, incredible diligent work that you've done. Um, and, and that leads to like, you know, it's just being so normal that Paul Manafort would make 70 something million dollars, you know, working for various Putin cutouts. And here we are. I wanna ask you, you have this incredible volume of work that is so, valuable in this time uh, in which we are living and dealing with. What is your favorite thing that you've ever done and why? God, I don't, you know, I don't have an easy answer to that. I, you know, it's, it's always sort of, I guess part of what doing, what's exciting about doing it is the thrill of the chase. I mean, it's like any good cop show you'd see or, or spy novel, you're on the hunt. And it's generally, with my books, the president of the United States, who's done something wrong. Um, and I also go after um, the unseen ways in which power works. And what I think is so um, distressing about American voters, the American public, is they don't really understand how things work. And uh, e even if you read the New York Times every day, you're not going to figure out how things work. And when I started out in journalism, the first book I read, I mean, every, everyone reads it, it's The Power Broker by Robert Cairo. And it's about Robert Moses, who was head of the New York Port Authority. He wasn't even an elected, an elected official, but he reshaped New York in ways that are monumental. And the way he used power was extraordinary. And I, that often happens when you when you're invite investigating uh, politics at the level of the White House, things did not happen the way people think they happen, and and there are levers of power that people do not see. Can I can I follow up on that for a second? Because I think I I, I have an example of what you're talking about in mind, and his name is Bill Barr. Um. We skipped over uh, the the 1988 election, right? Yeah. When Iran Contra <laughs> was exploding and was also being um, basically covered up by the 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 mainstream media and Bill Barr, right. um, uh, and and that helped Bush get reelect get elected um, af after Reagan. Um, and I, I just want to point out, you know, we were talking about the FBI, Reagan's CIA director, um, you know, was, uh, oh my God, I blank on his name. Casey. <laughs> Casey, William Casey, thank you. William Casey, um, uh, you know, was a, a religious lunatic in, in the Knights of Malta. Um, Bill Barr is an Opus Dei. Um, um, person who has been covering up things for decades now, right? But our our media still treats him like just, oh, he's just that he's just that guy. He's just that, you know, a Bill Barr guy. Um, and they they don't let people know, hey, this is the dude that has been covering things up for decades. All right. right? Well, well, well one is they want to interview him again. Right. They want access to them. That's part of it. Two is, I mean, if you're working for a major TV network or the New York Times or the Washington Post or whatever, they love a big name. It's a get. I got Bill, Bill Barr. I got the former attorney general. And my view is, and I learned this early in uh, 
uh, when I first started out, my hero and my mentor was sort of uh, I.F. Stone, who was one of the great radical journalists in history. And he, he said, one is you read read all the documents. No one reads them. Mm -hmm. No one actually reads the goddamn that, documents. That's but, one of my tricks, too. Right. But two is, and it shouldn't be a trick, because those are government records in, in general. And the other thing is the the big name sources are the worst. The, if they keep talking to you, if Henry Kissinger gives me a call, you think it's because he likes me? I'm not that stupid. He wants <laughs> something. He wants me to put carry water for him to give it, tell his story. Um, and it's uh, we we saw this come out in some of the impeachment on the January sixth. It's a lower level source, a Cassidy Hutchinson, who's in the room, who no one knows who she is really, but she's there. And she's taking notes and she's paying attention. And those are always, to me, the best sources. Um, but very few people in mainstream journalism do it. And, um, uh, you know, and I think it's a shame. And I think it makes the public, uh, uh, it means we, we know much less th about what's really going on. Exactly. We have what my friend Kira Giles calls collective amnesia. Even with what we do know, we seem to quickly forget because we're looking at the next shiny narrative. Back to Hi-Fi's question. The last time we spoke with you, the Charles McGonagall uh, story was breaking and uh, quickly receded from the headlines. We here talk a lot about limited hangouts, something I learned from our friend Jack A. Bryan about how a little piece of a, may more, a, may, a more major crime might be uh, you know, litigated, but um, with McGonagall and 2016, I just don't want to move past it so quickly. I just want to see with what you've been able to see and read and the documents that you've looked at and your knowledge of the FBI, as Hi-Fi said, somehow you, you once told us that uh, you're looking at the 2016 election as the greatest breach in or greatest failure in, in, in U.S. intelligence history. And I sometimes wonder, was it for them a success? Like, I just don't know. How, how, what's your thought on that? Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm really not sure what, what to do with all that, actually. Um, I think they, they, I think the FBI, uh, I've always thought there were two, at least two factions within the FBI and, and that there's some really good guys and then there's some others who aren't. And, and I, and I have to think if you're, just assume you're an FBI agent and your your boss, whether it's William Sessions or Louis Free, ends up being really chummy with the Russian mafia. Uh, what? The, how? How will you then go about doing your work? I mean, you're going to be very careful, and it ain't. And you're not. And you're going to realize if you go all out, you may be uh, hurting your own career. So, just in a careerist sensibility, wow. I think very few people think in those terms. But just imagine you put in your 20 years for the FBI and you see your boss is, is uh, being paid huge sums by Semyon Mogilevich, who you're investigating. Wow. Now, I, I did talk to one FBI agent who just sort of nodded and smiled. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't take a genius to see how that would work out, I think. I think it just took a genius to explain it to us so simply uh, we have a friend who's uh, working in Ukraine right now, documenting war crimes, and he said that he thinks one of the great failings of the United States is that we have not acknowledged that it was a bad idea to go into business with Russia in the 90s, particularly as Putin came in and we realize that we're now in in uh, intimately linked with a um, you know, a fascist mafia state. Do you have any ideas on what a solution for America could be? Because clearly your body of work shows that we have all of these ties and these financial entanglements. And how do we disentangle ourselves from something that really appears to be leading us toward darkness? You know, I, I, I think there are all sorts of ways and I, I shouldn't be the one writing these uh, prescriptions, but when I was investigating uh, Donald Trump's using uh, his real estate to launder money for the Russian mafia. It just became clear 
that the regulations regarding real estate transactions are a joke. They're ludicrous. Uh, I mean, all you have, all Trump doesn't have to be a genius to not ask, gee, did you get all your money from sex trafficking? Uh, a Russian mobster came in with $6 million in cash. But there's no way to convict him unless you, uh, Trump, that is, unless you can prove he had knowledge. And proving that he had knowledge is, is a very difficult thing to do. So he would never get uh, prosecuted for that in a million years. It's just insane. And it was interesting because I know I wrote to you uh, on Twitter about this, how, how Trump's associate Felix Sater loses his money laundering trial, which was a big deal because it included, you know, Trump properties. And uh, any comment on that? Like, well, no, I mean, Trump always keeps several lever levels of deniability. One is he'll say he didn't know where the money came from. Two is most many of those are Trump branded properties that he doesn't really own, but he does collect uh, uh, a, a very, a very substantial fee from them. So he sets it up. I mean, everything he sets up is is set up uh, with an eye towards finding the loopholes. There are loopholes in it, in everything. Lawyer, that's what lawyers do. They create loopholes when they write the laws, and then the they get hired out to exploit them. And I mean, it was always, I mean, I think I knew this coming out of college that um, you, you would, if, if someone was regulating banks in the government, they would then be hired away from their position at a, a much, much higher figure to help the banks worm their way around the, the regulations. Uh, I wanted to ask you about compromise. Um, we've got, uh, uh, currently, uh, or recently there were the Epstein files, uh, released, um, which have some just unbelievable allegations in them. Um, and the press refuses to even acknowledge its existence, um, while they're, you know, denigrating the other candidate. Um, I'm just curious what, um, you know, uh, and, and I know a little from reading, but um, what your experience is with that kind of compromise, you know, Epstein in particular, um, but also just how that sort of um, potential compromise um, affects people's behavior. Right. Well, I mean, with this, I, have, I unfortunately have more questions than answers, but there's, there is compromise out there. And one of the people I interviewed was a guy named John Mark Dugan, who was a uh, deputy sheriff in Palm Beach County. He was not a well-liked guy at all. And he was fired at one point, but he was there uh, when the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Department was investigating uh, Jeffrey Epstein. I think this was the first investigation that led to all the uh uh it led to that ridiculous uh, uh non-prosecution agreement that which that, which was by alex acosta right right the labor secretary for right. donald trump right well before it got that far they would raided epstein's home and then gotten hundreds of files and according uh to john mark dugan uh, who I, I should say, by the way, may be very well a dubious source and is someone I would not trust. But um, Dugan said um, someone who was part of the investigation gave him, I think, with 478 uh, sex tapes. Um, and as soon as he got them, or not long afterwards, uh, Dugan caught a plane to Canada and uh, th then got a flight to Moscow. And when he arrived in Moscow, he had a photo, he met with and had a photo of himself taken with a man named Pavel Borodin, who was uh, very close to Putin. So here he is supposedly with 478 sex tapes. Now we don't know who those sex tapes are really. Um, we know a lot of the names who've been on, on Epstein's plane and visit his islands and so forth. Uh, and there's certainly been reason to believe there, there were tapes made. Um, Dugan actually showed me a tape 
Um, but it was very, I don't know, don't know what to make of it. It was very grainy. It was black and white. It suggested technology from the 90s, maybe. Um, he said it was an, a media executive who made a high salary, but I'd never heard of him. I mean, uh, and there are many people in that category. But it, it gives you an idea of how he might be using that. Um, whether that's going on or not, I don't know. Um, it, it, that's as far as I've been able to get. Um, it's certainly possible. I mean, uh, you have Leon Black paid, I think it was it paid Epstein, I think $158 million or something, supposedly for tax advice. Well, what do you pay your account? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense um you know oh my gosh but i keep waiting for the other shoe to drop and i can't uh i can't um, i i don't know where it goes really i i also want to bring up uh, in the category of we don't know um the rnc was hacked we do know that the RNC was hacked by the Russians in 2016, but it was only the Democrats' dirty laundry, and it wasn't even really dirty. There was really nothing there. They just turned it into other shit. But the RNC's information uh, disappeared, as far as I know. And, um, uh, you know, again, it's speculation, but it seems to me... Um, quite likely that that was also uh, a, a time because you could see it, you could just feel a shift in the Republicans in 2016, right? They just whoosh, they all of a sudden this, this group that was completely hawkish on Russia for decades is just like, oh, yeah, big power, he's fine. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just wondering your thoughts. Yeah, I'm afraid I don't really have any information on that. I, I yeah, guess. Lindsey Graham is the closest we can get to just kind of go, uh huh. Um, so Lindsey, Lindsey Graham, you know, Lindsey oh, yeah, Graham did yeah, that, yeah. you know, that 180. Like, um, it was whoo. He's, he's like, did. he's like, I got hacked, and I love me some Trump. You know, it was yeah, like, yeah. it was, it was like that. Um, super quick for me, just like I got two more things. Um, I'm just going to read something back that you said the last time we interviewed you in uh, early 2023, where you said Donald Trump was a Russian asset. He was cultivated by the KGB going back to the 80s. Russia really owns him. And the myth of Trump as a great businessman is really ridiculous. He had bankruptcy after bankruptcy after bankruptcy when he overexpanded into Atlantic City and he was bailed out again and again by the Russians. Russian mafia, part of Russian intelligence. They're not at odds with each other. They're an instrument of Russian intelligence. I say that out loud, just in case we can somehow penetrate past the propaganda. And when you hear those words uh, read back to you in that way, does any you know anything come to mind on how we can get people to understand what's right in front of them? Uh, no, I think it's really difficult, and that's the most distressing thing I can think of. And I, I, I may have said earlier that when I started out, you had these explosive stories like the My Lai Massacre or Watergate or the Pentagon Papers. And it seemed to me the entire nation was tuned into that. And today, that is not the case. And I think the January 6th Commission did an excellent job of making a spectacle under with Jamie Raskin and, and Liz Cheney and all that. And they they made it, uh, um, you know, it has to be a dramatic spectacle. Watergate was binge watching for me. You know, you have to do that again. It's the only way. And now things are so atomized into every little Twitter sub-constituency. Um, so uh, it's very, very hard to have something that would have that impact. I mean, look at, you know, you have the president uh, being uh, adjudicated a rapist. He's a convicted felon. Uh, he's stolen uh, documents. And yet none of this really sort of penetrates. And, and, I, and I think part of the problem, too, is the nature of the Trump cult. 
because he has fashioned himself into being the savior, the warrior for these forgotten people. And of course, I think that's a joke, but they don't. And they respond the same way that if you would attack Jesus. And uh, I mean, that Marjorie Taylor Greene said, my Lord is a convicted felon. You know, that's what she meant. Uh, and she was equating Trump and, and Christ. So um, it takes someone better than me to penetrate all that. I don't know what it is. I, you know, I, and I've been trying to do it using reporting, empirical evidence, fact-based world. That's where I live. Um, but that does not, those weapons don't really work in, in their world. And that, that's what's really upsetting. Well, what's but, amazing, though, is that you are you are bubbling above the surface, at least to those who are not necessarily in the cult. So the work is making a difference in getting a wider audience. And, you know, we're working very hard on penetrating the cult. And we've had a little bit of success here and there. But you once said something very brilliant on the Chauncey de Vega show in 2018. You said America needs to have a shared narrative of truth. Yeah. And 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 that is what has been denigrated, both. Well, that, by the but I I mean I do, I do go into this much more in uh, in my next book. I mean, and it's it's you know it's it, if you've ever been in therapy or whatever, everyone's in denial to some extent. You have to come to terms with it. And, but this country won't come to terms. And ours goes back to slavery. When uh, when uh, when Thomas Jefferson said all men are created equal. He didn't include women. He didn't include African Americans. He didn't include his own children with Sally Hemings. So not all men were created equal, and it's a lie. And we've uh, re refused to embrace the truth for too long. And I, and I think we see uh, the chickens coming home to roost now. So true. I have one more thing for me, and then hi you close this out. Um, with the book that is coming out October 1st of De is Den of Spies, and I'm very excited, and we're going to put the pre-order link in. But but one book that we never talk about, along with American Compromat and House of uh, Trump and House of Putin, is we don't talk about House of Saudi, House of Bush. And I think it's all tied. Can you give us just a couple hot lines on that? Well, I mean, I mean, more recently, you see, of course, the Saudis uh, invested two billion dollars with Jared Kushner, and I, and and I, and and, and by the way, that um, when you look at the upcoming election, you see the House of Saud, Bibi Netanyahu, and Vladimir Putin all want to see Donald Trump reelected. So, I will watch to see how that plays out. But um, I mean, and, and with House of Bush, House of Sound, I wrote it uh, just after 9-11. And I realized I, I was in New York that day uh, and um, I wasn't really sure how to respond. But in the end, I Googled because uh, I knew that the Bushes were close to the Saudis. And within an hour or two, I got to uh, a company I never heard of then called the Carlisle Group. And the principles in it included... Uh, of former President Bush Sr., George H.W. Bush, his son uh, in, in a different, through a subsidiary, and uh, some of their cabinet officials, whether it was Richard Darman, Frank Carlucci, and others. And they were in partnership with the Saudis. And, and I, I spent a couple of hours going over and I realized, oh, the Bushes are business partners with this family, the Bin Ladens. I see. That's interesting. That has some meaning. And and I, I think we saw some of that came out just a few weeks ago um, in, in court documents uh, with the the 9-11 families that uh, of the role of the official Saudi government uh, in in uh, in which they were complicit with the events of 9-11. Mic drop. <laughs> Mic drop. Hi, Fi. Final question. And then I got one final comment. Unless it's it's not a, it's not a question so much as it is an observation. You know, one of the things we talk about on this show is cognitive warfare and the information sphere. And um, you know, Craig's exactly right. Back during the '60s and the '70s, America had kind of a singular, cogent information sphere. We had 
CBS, ABC, and NBC. And things started to go to hell when CNN appeared. And then we had NSNBC. And then we have 24-hour news cycles. And people get overloaded. And the information sphere started to fracture and fragment. And people can be captured in those fragments if they're only watching CNN or if they're only watching OAN or if they're only watching Fox News. We, we know that this is, whether or not it was intentional, the end result is the same in which we no longer have a shared reality. And when people like Craig Unger bring us information that definitively show, you know, hard facts, data, this is what occurring. People can't handle that because they're so trapped in their own little information bubbles. And you're right, January 6th committee, it brought all those information bubbles together. It, it popped a bunch of individual spheres and brought people together into kind of a shared reality. But then that fracturing took it away again, and we've forgotten it all. We've right. forgotten that Donald I, Trump is a rapist who attempted a coup. Right, and what I was hoping is some of these trials would be televised, of course, but once again, Trump has gotten delay after delay after delay, and it's not happening for the election. Yeah, so that, that brings me to my final question. Jim, do you have anything else you want to say before I uh, round it out? Thank you, everybody. I'm so glad we were able to do this today. I feel a million times better because I have so much clarity and it always is so reassuring when we talk to you, Craig. Um, just, you know, in your studies and your work and all the, all the work you do around these subject matters, uh, this type of subject matter, are we safe in a, uh, a next Trump presidency? Are those of us who do <laughs> investigative reporting, are we safe? That's called a softball. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think it's just petrifying. I mean, if you look at Project 2025, uh, this is a recipe for the end of democracy. It is as simple as that. And, and um, I, you know, I spent years not using the word fascist, and now I have to use it occasionally, you know. And and uh, this is the brink. And I, I, one of my best friends is German, and. He says it's 1933 in Germany. This is where we are. And in effect, the Supreme Court has done, uh, given, if, if Trump were elected, given him such a wide berth, it's very akin to the Enabling Act in 1933 that gave Hitler so many powers. The Holocaust oh. is legal in Germany. Right, yeah. right. Wow. Um, well, Jim did say that one of the things I learned recently was that uh, Abraham Lincoln ignored the Supreme Court. And maybe we need to figure out uh, something like that. Craig Unger, the books are American Compromat, House of Trump, House of Putin, the upcoming Den of Spies, House of Saudi, House of Bush. Your work is just so impeccable. I'm so grateful that you took the time to be with us today. And, uh, you know, it is 1933 Germany. And as we always say, if you're wondering what you would be doing during the rise of fascism in Germany, you're doing it now. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I really enjoyed it. You're the best. Thank you so much. Thanks, when the Trump campaign was caught colluding with Russia, the American people were promised a counterintelligence investigation. The FBI is investigating the Russian government. But the Trump Justice Department quashed it. Now, for the first time, hear the true story of Donald Trump's Russian recruitment told from inside the KGB. While Trump is gone, the Russian operation never ended. And as Americans, we cannot move on until we understand the lies, corruption, and blackmail that compromised the most powerful nation on Earth. From best-selling author Craig Unger, American Compromat. Available wherever books are sold.